begin studying this morning. I do find myself in a bit of an odd position today. Uh, some of you have already seen Malcolm is here for the first time with us. Those who are visiting, my two-month-old son is making his uh, Woodland Hills debut. And so, to many people probably, uh, it's really not going to matter what I say. Uh, this sermon could be terrible, and I know on the way out, people are just going to be saying, Malcolm is great. We love Malcolm. He is, he is wonderful. Um, so I, I could just really tank it up here and, and really just give you my worst effort, and I'd probably still have some nice words said to me afterward, and we could all go home feeling good. But I'm not going to do that. I am still going to give you my best effort. We're very glad to have uh, him with us today, Beth, be able to uh, come out as well. It has been a long time for her that she has been wanting to see you. So let me say from all four of us, uh, we're very glad to be with you this morning and all of the fellowship we're able to enjoy together as God's people. The Word of God is a, a wonder. It is a marvelous thing that we have when we hold a Bible in our hands. That 19th Psalm that we read from a moment ago, I believe, is making a favorable comparison between the scriptures, the law of the Lord, the, the written word that we have from God, and the wonders of creation itself. I think he is really comparing those two. They are both means through which men know God. They both explain in some measure who he is and what he is, what his nature is, something about his character and his power and his wisdom and goodness. But when you consider those two things together, I mean, picture... Your, your favorite sight in nature, whatever it might be, if you've been to the Grand Canyon and that was the one that, that blew you away and you said, no, there is no picture that does it justice, you have to experience that in person. Or whether you just picture the, the most marvelous sunset or sunrise that you've ever seen or whatever the case might be, just some absolute wonder of nature that makes you just, it almost knocks you off your feet. The writer is saying here, in, in similar measure, the scriptures declare the glory of God. They show who he is. They show how good he is and how greatly to be praised. This morning I want to do something a little bit different. If you would be turning over to the book of Daniel, I want to study with you together from the book of Daniel this morning. We'll really spend all of our time there, the remainder of our time this morning. Typically we, or I, like to just kind of find a passage of scripture, give ourselves 10 or 12 verses or so and kind of work our way through that and maybe get to the bottom of, of what's being said in that passage and, and kind of pull out all that we can from one particular text. Uh, this morning I want to take more of a, a bird's eye view, as we're calling it, and just look downward, look down right on top of the book of Daniel, largely for the purpose of helping us to appreciate, maybe to understand and to better appreciate the way in which biblical books are often organized and take away some strengths from that concept itself. We understand kind of innately the value of structure and the value of organization. Any business that you're a part of, any company that you would be a, a member of, you have noticed either good organization or maybe a distinct lack of organization and how well that company functions. If you know exactly who you're reporting to and what their job is and what they can do to help you fulfill your job and who might be reporting to you and appealing to your help on doing their job, you understand how things, when they work cleanly and when everyone knows what they're supposed to do, when and how they're supposed to do it, and things move along smoothly, you say, yes, this works. You want to be a part of that company. In your home, we all, to varying degrees, like to have some organization. I typically like things to be very, very organized. I am the guy who has, you know, ties organized by color. And I like all my, you know, certain socks go in this drawer and certain socks go in this drawer. I have some of those tendencies that make people roll their eyes. Uh, those have all been kind of relaxed uh, in the last two months, especially having uh, having the little ones running around pulling socks out of every drawer does kind of uh, hamper some of that need that I have to a degree. But we understand if I want to get this kitchen utensil, I like to know where it is. 
And if I want to wear this item of clothing, it, it sure helps if I know where it's going to be. We just kind of innately see the value in things being put together in a specific way. The content of two things might be exactly identical, but if you rearrange them, you get a totally different picture and you get a totally different impression from all of that information or content. And so I want to use Daniel as a a case study this morning to just very briefly look at that idea that we find very prevalent in the scripture. God, in writing his book, seems to have taken great pains in putting his story together in a particular way. And that leads us to several useful conclusions, I believe. Let's look at this, and I'm, I'm just really taking this structure directly from a wonderful book on the topic. I have it listed there at the bottom of that slide. Uh, Dr. David Dorsey's uh, The Literary Structure of the Old Testament. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I think that's the, the best place to look. But... You look at the book of Daniel, you have really three primary parts, and it's easy to divide things in that way because Daniel is actually written in two languages. We don't really appreciate that because we read it in one language. We read it all in English, all together. But the first chapter is written in Hebrew, and you get this introduction to Daniel and his friends, who they are, what they're doing. Then you have a section that's written in Aramaic. The next six chapters are written in a different language from the first one. And you find those six chapters being delivered in a specific way. The first and last are looking at a similar theme. There will be a vision of four kingdoms delivered in two different types of visions. The first in chapter two, you're familiar with that great image of a man that Daniel saw made out of different materials that represented the different nations that would come onto the stage, different great world empires that would come and would all ultimately really have their power broken and demolished and brought to nothing through the power of God's kingdom that Christ was going to establish, a wonderful image. Well, then you have a similar image of four beasts who who served that same function in chapter 7. Then you've got in chapters 3 and 6 two stories about Martyrs, essentially, are those who were prepared to be martyrs. They were martyrs in the true, literal definition of the word, being witnesses to God's power. But Daniel's three friends in chapter 3, willing to die the death of the fiery furnace. Daniel himself in chapter 6, willing to be thrown into the lion's den because they would not compromise on their faith. Then in chapters 4 and 5, you have God interacting with Babylonian kings, men who were proud, men who elevated themselves to stations that they had no business occupying and who are humbled because of their pride. The lesson comes through in each one of those that God alone is sovereign, and there's quite a bit made of that. Then you have in chapters 8 through 12 a concluding section in Hebrew, uh, returning to that language, And it is primarily concerned with these various visions that Daniel receives about what is going to happen with his people. Now, when you look at these sections in even smaller detail, let's take, for instance, those chapter 3 and chapter 6 stories. You see that they themselves are organized in a very similar fashion. And follow this same kind of ascending and descending pattern as they are laying the story out for us. You find in each case, after a short introduction, there is some plot by the enemies of God's people, the enemies of God, as it turns out, Babylonian authorities in each case. In the first instance, they bring a complaint against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they have not fallen down to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar has told men that they all must worship. In chapter 6, it is Daniel's enemies, of course, who see him praying every day to Jehovah, and they decide this will be what we can use to trip Daniel up because he doesn't have any other skeletons in his closet. He's a righteous man. We don't want him to be as powerful as he is, and so we'll convince the king to pass a law that if you pray to anyone else other than the king and offer any kind of Uh, any kind of homage to anyone else, then you'll be killed. And so they start hatching these plots. Then in the next step of each story alike, Daniel or his friends, they remain faithful. They don't compromise. They don't go back on what they have done. Then the turning point in the story is them being thrown into the difficulty. The, the, The three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. 
And it, it's so hot that, I mean, it's, it's going to kill the people who are bringing them into that furnace. They're just thrown into the middle of it. Daniel is cast into this den of hungry lions. And if you've ever been anywhere close to a lion, you understand. I, I would not want anything to do with a whole bunch of those animals when they're in their predatory mode. Surely he's going to be dead within just a few seconds. But in both cases, no harm comes to them. The three men emerge from the fiery furnace, not even a hair singed. Nothing has happened to them. They didn't even get burned. Their skin isn't even really red when they come out of that oven. Daniel, thrown into the lion's den. The lions just didn't seem to have any interest in him, did they? Evidently, they weren't so hungry after all. The Lord stops their mouths. Daniel escapes unscathed. Well, then in the next part of the story, you see them coming out and being presented to the king, who formerly had had some kind of distress he, he, he hated that he was being betrayed, kind of, by his, his favorites, these faithful Jews. And now when he sees what has happened, he's, he's delighted, especially in Daniel's case. King Darius was so happy to see Daniel alive. And then you get a, a reversal of fortunes towards the end of the story. The decision is made that if anyone speaks against Daniel or speaks against his God, then he's going to be punished. And the punishment offered is, is exactly the same thing that was intended for these faithful Jews. If you speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Or those men who had plotted against Daniel and tried to have him killed, they get thrown into the lion's den. You get that kind of upheaval at the end. And so at the very conclusion of each story, those martyrs, potential martyrs, are honored. They're given even greater honors and plaudits than they had before. They're promoted to great position. We see their reward for maintaining their faith in God. So again, kind of a, a top-down view. Those are short sketches of each of those stories, but can't you see how very similar they are? They're arranged in similar way, and they're put in a specific position in the book in order to serve a certain function. I've treated the subject very, very briefly this morning because well, I, I know it isn't everyone's cup of tea to look at these kind of ideas, and I don't want to belabor the point too much. But I do want to say that there is a point. Why would we spend time looking at uh, chiastic structures? Why would we spend time looking at the kind of symmetry that we tend to find in these biblical books and stories? Is there any benefit? Let me make this point, first of all, especially for, I, I especially have in mind our young people or maybe even those who are young in the faith and are not as accustomed to dealing with non-believing friends, uh, co-workers who will be antagonistic towards the Bible, things such as that. Let us point out that if we can understand the, the literature of the Bible as much as the scripture, and by that I mean the way the content is delivered to us, if we understand and appreciate that more, we gain greater appreciation for the value on every level that the Bible does have. We appreciate the book of God for its singular perfection, its quality, even from an aesthetic standpoint, even from a purely human standpoint, we just see what a good book it is. If, again, speaking to our, our younger people, if you have not already very soon you will begin to hear people, your friends or people on TV or on YouTube or whoever it might be, talking about how unreliable the Bible is. That it is really just this work of, you know, barely literate nomadic sheep herders from the Bronze Age. These guys from 3,500 years ago who didn't know up from down, they had no understanding of science, they had no understanding of Art. They had no understanding of anything other than their own superstitions. And they thought that this guy in the sky was telling them all these weird things to do. And so they just kind of wandered around the earth making things up and ultimately wrote them down in their crude language that they could come up with. The Bible is filled with misinformation and all this unevolved backwards thinking. It doesn't hold any value today for people who have progressed beyond the need for this sloppily constructed book of fairy tales. I'm making this point to say, if and when you hear someone say those kinds of things, 
you can identify quickly that you are talking to someone who hasn't studied the Bible very well. And I don't say this to insult anyone or to cause us to look down on someone else. But we should be aware of the dynamics in play in those conversations. If you hear that kind of rhetoric from someone, you're talking to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. They don't understand the Bible. They haven't actually looked at it. They haven't taken any time to appreciate the nature of book that it actually is. And so because of that, don't be too troubled by any of the arguments they make against it. Do your own homework. Look at the Bible for what it is. See the scriptures for their own merits and discover in full just how wonderful a book it is. In fact, what we see over and over again from honest students, and that includes non-believers among them, we see from people who actually take the time to delve into the Bible a sense of awe and a sense of wonder at the fine construction of the books themselves. Aside from any other concern, aside from the greater concern of believing what is actually within it and knowing, as Paul would say, that it is this gospel that can save man, Aside from those concerns, it's a wonderful work of literature. We can say, in the true sense of the word, it is a work of art. And those who actually take time to, to view it as such can come to no other conclusion. It is artfully constructed. There is a reason that the psalmist delighted in the laws of God. There is a reason that we would, would read that 19th psalm where he he's comes to the conclusion that the, the law is, is sweeter than honey. It is to be desired even more than gold. That is not just because of the content and what it reveals, but because it does so beautifully. It stands up to scrutiny on every level, and we see some of that innate value in its quality as a written work. Now again, let me hasten to add we cannot stop at mere appreciation, but we certainly can start there. And we certainly can, can revel in the beauty of these biblical stories and the way that God has told us the story of salvation. Let me also say a side benefit to these kinds of studies and concepts. If we get used to looking for these things and, and kind of asking that question when you read a biblical story, we can help ourselves to discern the meaning behind some difficult passages or some texts that may be put together in kind of a confusing way. I've mentioned as an example Jeremiah chapters 34 and 35. I actually did a sermon on this months ago by now, but I'll reiterate a little bit of what we talked about at the time. If you look at Jeremiah 34 and you read the story there, and then you go into Jeremiah 35, and you notice, well, this is talking about something that happened like 20 years before the story I just read. It deals with a lot of different people. I don't really see any immediate connection between what's going on there. But then you understand, well, God puts things together in a certain way for a certain reason. What's the meaning behind that? And you plow forward a little bit, and you try to figure out, well, what is the meaning behind it? Why have they been organized in that fashion. I think those two chapters together, in fact, prove a very compelling point between the two of them. In chapter 34, you have men who immediately went back on their word when they had vowed before God and before their brethren that they were going to finally obey the Lord. They started doing that and then immediately said, actually, we don't want to do that. We're going to do something different. In chapter 35, you have a depiction of men, the sons of Rechab, who have for generations, for hundreds of years, followed these very kind of arcane, esoteric commandments that their father gave to them and said, don't live in a city, don't drink any fruit of the vine, don't, don't live in anything other than a tent outside of town. And it told his, his sons and their sons' sons to do these very specific things. And the Lord says, for hundreds of years, they've done that. What's your excuse, Israel? They listen to their father. Why won't you listen to your God? Well, we see then those two chapters back to back really accentuate that point and drive things home. They're not chronological. They don't have other thematic ties between them, but they do prove a point. If we get used to kind of looking for what that trick might be or for what that clue might be to those little mysteries, 
It can add even greater rewards to our study. What I want to spend the rest of our time together this morning looking at, it again, just in brief summary, is that these types of literary devices, like when we see those symmetrically organized chapters and texts, they naturally guide our attention, usually to those central points, or usually to the, the points of similarity in those stories, really oftentimes without even knowing what we're seeing, without knowing that those passages have been organized in such a way, we pick up on what God is trying to do in delivering them in that fashion. We see the point of emphasis. And that's the most important reason we might look at structure or any other related concept is because it's there for a reason. And that reason is to more easily and more accurately reveal to us the will of God, the mind of God. So let's look together. I want to focus again for just a few moments on this one section of Daniel, chapters 2 through 7, the section that is written in the Aramaic language, and figure out from that kind of short case study. It's organized, as we see, in three pairs of stories, and each pair seems to emphasize a specific particular point here God is telling us the same thing in different ways. He'll use slightly different events to illustrate and emphasize specific truths. So if I'm reading one of those chapters, or if I'm looking at all of them as a whole, what does he want us to learn? What am I meant to take away from that? Think of chapter 2 and chapter 7 that show these prophecies of Four kingdoms. As we mentioned already in chapter 2, it takes the form of a great image of a man, a great statue of a man who's constructed out of really four different materials. And that statue, that image ends up being destroyed by this rock that is taken not with hands, not with human hands. This rock is taken and really rolled into the image and finds itself being broken in pieces and totally consumed. Well, then in chapter 7, you've got a pretty similar prophecy, a pretty similar image given in a different set of images. Four beasts who each come in succession as well and have their own varying power and have their own varying uh, terror that they will wreak on the world. But in this case, too, they end up being subdued. And give way to an even greater kingdom. And we see then the Ancient of Days has all thrones put in place. And the Son of Man comes and receives from the Ancient of Days dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. These two stories are getting to the same point, just in different ways. And they're showing us that the Lord exhibits this, this immense power on a global scale. Think of, maybe we take it for granted because we have looked at those passages. I, at least, I guess, have looked at those passages since I was a little kid. I know many of you would be in the same boat. You've studied the image of Nebuchadnezzar, and you've talked about the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek or Macedonian Empire and the Roman Empire that would come after them. And you, you know, you've heard those stories for so long. Maybe we lose appreciation for exactly what Daniel is telling us here, that all of those things are ordered by God. That human history on the grandest scale is manipulated and is controlled by God himself. That something does not happen unless God allows it to happen. You think of all of the, the great men in history that would be found in those stories that have altered human civilization, the trajectory of our very species that was altered during the time of Nebuchadnezzar or Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or any of the great men who would appear on the pages of that history and change things throughout the entire planet because of what they would do. And Daniel is here telling us this is all due to God's power. It is God who rules in the affairs of men. That's telling us something extraordinary about Jehovah. 
All of this control spanning centuries, we come to that same conclusion. What an awesome God this is that Daniel is telling us about. He is incredibly powerful. But then focus on those next sets of stories. In chapter 3 and chapter 6, what we talked about in more detail a moment ago, stories of men who were faithful. They were put into difficult, almost surely fatal situations, and yet no harm comes to them whatsoever. This adds to the previous point that we saw. Okay, we're dealing with a God who has all power. We're dealing with a God who can see Alexander's empire stretch to virtually the entire known world at the time. We're seeing that God who rules in the affairs of men and kingdoms rise and fall at his will. But is this a God who can lose sight of the trees for the forest? Is this a God who is only interested if things are big? Well, I'm God. I can't really devote my time micromanaging these people. I've got to look at the big picture. I've got kings to set up. I've got borders to draw. I've got geopolitics to take care of. And sometimes a Daniel or a Meshach might slip through the cracks and end up coming to their fate because I just couldn't be there for them. That's not the God of Daniel whatsoever. Instead, these stories show us that while we have this this incredibly powerful God, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He does not cease to remember those who are faithful. He does not cease to remember each individual. We will find later on in the scripture an even more telling statement, compelling statement from the Lord himself that the very hairs on your head are numbered, that God knows in intimate detail everything about you. And Daniel is giving us some indication of that already right now. God knows how to deliver the faithful. He knows how to reward those who have fidelity to him, who maintain their integrity and worship God no matter what is brought against them. He sees that. When you do that, when you make the decision to be faithful to God, he is aware of that. Even though he is the God of all the earth, he sees you. He is attentive to you. That's a wonderful thought to dwell on. Then you see kind of nestled in the heart of that structure there, A couple of stories about Babylonian kings, Nebuchadnezzar and his son or grandson, as it turns out, Belshazzar. Two kings of great pride, two men who were both humble. Nebuchadnezzar, to his ultimate benefit, it seems, he recognized the point of that humiliation at the end of his ordeal in chapter 4. You can read that chapter for yourself. Chapter 5, Belshazzar does not have time to learn a lesson. He is told by that hand writing on the wall that he's already been measured and weighed. He's been found wanting. And that very night, his kingdom is taken from him. He himself is deposed and killed. What do those stories tell us? Men might stand against God. All the claims I have made about Jehovah this morning will surely be debated in public circles. They will surely be laughed at and scorned. As we mentioned a moment ago, you will definitely encounter those in your life who would ridicule you for believing anything that we read in here or anything I have said this morning. They would say that's just foolishness. The proud of the earth might stand against God and might elevate them to his position and believe that they are the ultimate authority in something. But God is always sovereign. As we talked about in our class, that perception does not make something a reality. And no matter what men might think about God, it does not change his nature as the ultimate judge, the ultimate one to whom we must give account of ourselves. We must acknowledge him. Decide your course of action based on who and what he is. Going to pause for a few moments, brother. I'm going to pause. We're going to sing a song here for just a moment. Brother Fletcher is going to lead us. Standing on the Promises, I believe, is the song that he has chosen. We're talking this morning, yeah, we're looking in the book of Daniel. But really, I hope what we are taking away from this is the value in the word of God. Not just as something that is beautiful. Something that is beautiful to behold and interesting to read and that stands up to scrutiny from any quarter it could be offered from but a book that has its greatest value because it is trustworthy. It's reliable. What God says to you on these pages is truthful, and he will not be found a liar after the fact. 
and having fallen short to carry out a promise that he has made. We stand on those promises. Let's remind ourselves of that as Brother Fletcher leads us. Number 360, standing on the promises. Let us track all of those headlines, really, of the story of Daniel chapters 2 through 7 as you progress through them. You, You first see that indication that God is incredibly powerful. He is the ruler of all things. You'd then be confronted with the fact that God evidently rewards the faithful with deliverance from impossible odds. There's nothing that can defeat them. There's nothing that can take them away from the power of God when he is shielding those who appeal to him. Then you would see that God humbles the proud. He judges them and he proves his authority. He proves his sovereignty, that he alone is God, proves that to all and leaves no doubt to anyone who is viewing the scene. That kind of three-step process to me sounds very applicable today, doesn't it? We must still recognize these same things about our God and make similar decisions based on that realization. God continues to rule all things and exert all power. He continues to reward the faithful as he has in every age before ours and will in every age to come. He rewards those who diligently seek him. And God will humble the proud. He will offer ultimate judgment. Those who stand against him will not do so always. There will come a time when we can no longer run from our judgment. We can no longer call upon, as Isaiah depicts men in the time of judgment, calling upon the the mountains to fall upon them, to hide them from the judgment of God. That will not be possible in the final tally. These ideas spell out for us very clearly which side we want to be on and what our response needs to be. That is the invitation, the appeal that we make to you this morning. Recognize your need to behave this way towards God, to have your faith be placed in him. The, The wonderful statement, we have not looked at very many details of these stories in Daniel, but one of my favorite statements in the entire book is made by these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, beginning in verse 16 of chapter 3. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. It's always kind of a sad thing to me that they're known by their Babylonian names, not their Hebrew names that they were given. These were proud men of Jehovah. But after Nebuchadnezzar tells them, if you don't do what I want to do, if you don't worship this, this idol of myself that I have erected, You're dead. You're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. I guess there would be the promise at least of it being a quick death because the fire was so hot, but it will be a horrible one unless you worship this image. You're done. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar asked them. Their response in verse 16. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case that we die, that we're thrown into the fiery furnace. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Their faith was such that they knew Jehovah was God. They knew that they must serve him no matter what. Their belief was, he will save us from this peril. He will save us from this death. But ultimately, their confidence was far greater to the point of 100% confidence in the fact that even if he allowed their physical bodies to perish, there was still no way they could do anything other than worship him. They could not give allegiance to any other. We won't serve any other God because he alone is God. He can save us. We know he can. We believe he will. But that is our final opinion on the matter. 
That is faith in God. It does not presume upon his will. It does not presume upon the decisions that he will make in our lives. But it states with ironclad certainty that he is capable of saving and that he is the only God a man can serve. Well, gratefully, wonderfully for us, in a spiritual sense, that, that even if idea that the three friends had is, is not our case. There is no doubting, there is no chance of salvation, there is no possibility that God might go one direction or might go another when we are talking about the salvation of our souls, we know for sure that the one who calls upon the Lord will be saved. That the one who appeals to the grace of God, the mercy of God, through that response of a clear conscience, through repenting of his sins and being baptized into Christ, we know that God will save does and has and always will save those who approach him in such a way. Appeal to him in the faith that our forefathers have had. Appeal to him in the faith that the scriptures portray for us in such a beautiful way. Appeal to him with that faithful, loving obedience that God has always rewarded. And know that you certainly will be saved. If that's your need this morning, please make it known. Come forward if you would. While we stand, while we sing this song.